about time you showed up. Well, I was watching the game. Watching the game. Chargers. <laughs> yeah, I don't like them. Yeah. I wish I lived in California again. No, I don't. No, you don't. No, no. I don't. Never no, mind. Don't. No. Anyway, I heard about a new problem somebody was having. Something a new problem? Nobody's ever heard of. Before. Oh, goody. I like a new problem. This new problem is that the guy says that he's got loose wheel bearings. Well, I say he's got loose wheel bearings because he's got a vibration in the steering wheel and he's got some cupping on the outside of his tires. I thought you said we we're going to have a new problem here. You know, play along. Play along. Okay. Work with me. Work with me. <laughs> All right. Loose wheel bearings. The first question comes up is, what is a loose wheel bearing? How do we define it? How do we find it? Okay. What is a correctly adjusted bearing? How do we do it? And number three, what would be too tight of a bearing? True. Three concerns. What are we trying to accomplish here? Since we're tire guys, the first thing I'm always looking at is the tire. What is the tire telling me is wrong? And over the years, I've learned that certain types of cupping in a tire tend to be related to wheel bearings. Okay. Inside edge on the inside duals tends to relate to wheel bearings. Cupping on the shoulder on steer tires, one edge or the other or both, tend to be caused by wheel bearings. So those are the first things we're looking for. Second, how do we find it? Let's say we jack up a front wheel. Now a lot of guys will try to jack up the middle of the axle. Now the whole axle teeter totters back and forth. You can't find anything loose. Sometimes it's hard. So we jack up one side and leave one side on the ground solid. Of, of an axle. And it doesn't matter if it's a drive axle or a steer axle. doesn't matter. Just jack up the one side. One if side. Put, if you happen to have one of those hollow tube axles, put the jack under the saddle. And lift that. It's a preferred way. Right? You can also lift it, lift it by the bolts because you're not going to sure. take anything off. Sure. So going on the end of the bolt or the hook bolts or everything. Oh, yeah. So now we jack it up one side at a time. We have two tapered opposed bearings in that assembly. Yes, we do. When you jack the wheel up off the ground, the hub will slide in the valley between those two bearings. And it will feel tight depending on how you wiggle on it. How you wiggle it? Wiggle it. Some guys will take a bar and shove it in through the handhole of the tire and Crank try to there. pry on it to see if it's loose. Okay, but what no they're move. doing is they're only moving the, the hub on one aspect of the bearing. We find we have to wiggle it back and forth in order to get it loose. So a pry bar on a steer axle generally could find a kingpin loose, but it'll tend to miss a wheel bearing. Misses it. Misses it. Misses it. So how do, how do you, let's say you're sticking to the steer. <laughs> Other than the fact that you've already got cupping wear on the outside. Which of may or may not be caused by the bearing. May not be caused by it. We are diagnosing this situation. But other than that, how do you find on the steer then this play? The most effective way I've found is to grip the top of the tread of the tire. Physically grip it. Don't just push on the tire. Don't just pull on the tire. Grip it. Grip it. And then push and pull back that and forth. Rib. You grip that outside rib. And just you give it a good pull. Hurt. What if it's so cut that you don't have an outside rib anymore? You got a problem. Got a problem. <laughs> Turn it to where you can get a grip nails. on it. Long yeah. fingernails. Uh, I know that. Uh, yeah, so get them right in there. Not just a nice really. uh, drive nails in, some to hold on to. <laughs> no, okay. We won't do that either. You, you, you got to have to push and pull push at and the pull top of the tire. To wiggle it back and forth up onto the bearing to find the play. And it will, will hear what? Click, click, click. Click, 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 click. Bearings click. loose. If you can push and pull, you will hear it. If you hear clunk, clunk, that tends to be a kingpin. Well, how would we tell the difference? The simplest way to tell the difference is to apply the steer axle brake. Right. Step on the brake. Have somebody step on the brake. Or, or make a slide tool that fits between the brake tool, and the sure, sure. Now you can do it by yourself. Point being. If the movement stops when the brake's applied, it's a bearing. Because the bearing, you can't tell that there's anything, any play there as long as the brake is... Brake's locked up, it's not going to move. If the movement continues, it's a kingpin. Ah, so if you can get the clunk, 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 even though you've got the brakes on, that means the entire spindle Assembly. is moving back and forth on Correct. the kingpin. Now, as a general rule, I am much less concerned about kingpin play than wheel bearings. 
as a general rule. Bearings are very important. Extremely, because the tire sitting on a bearing is constantly wiggling back and forth, and it's going to give you this perpetual cupping. The kingpin is loose when the weight is on the spindle. That kingpin's kind of locked into place anyway. Generally. So I don't get nearly as much cupping out of a kingpin as I do on a wheel bearing. The other thing is adjusting a wheel bearing is 20 minutes worth of work. A kingpin is a half a day. And a lot of money. And a lot of money. So I'm, I'm less concerned about that. Now that's how I would diagnose a steer axle. If I go back to a drive or a trailer axle, with two tires, rims, drum, hub, I've got 500 pounds of weight hanging in. When I jack up the one side, that 500 pounds of weight loads down on it. Sitting down on a, a much larger bearing now. And as older as I am, it's getting harder and harder for me to wiggle that and find anything. Wiggle this drive axle and think you're going to So what it. I do is I take a tire iron, mm -hmm. and I slip the tire iron under the tire, and I put a socket down as a fulcrum to use as a lever, and then I can push on the top of the tire iron, and I'll find a problem. We'll put a picture in here someplace of that so people know what I'm talking about. Okay, the interest, interesting point there being when you're pushing up and down on the bottom of the tire, mm -hmm. on, the, on the outside, on the outside, the outside of the uh, drive wheel position, you're actually pushing up and out. Yes, you're levering it because the, the position of the pressure is so far out below to the bearing. You are, yes, you are not lifting it. You're right. pushing it in and out. Yeah, and you'll find the movement. That's you'll feel it. You'll hear it if that axle shaft is banging against clunk, the side gear. Clunk, 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 clunk. That's a bearing on a drive axle. Because there's really nothing else that, that moves there. Correct. Shouldn't be anything else that moves there. <laughs> okay, so we've been able to diagnose it. We've looked at the tire where we said oh, it looks like a being. We jacked it up, and depending on whether it's a steer axle or a drive axle, I'll use a lever to help me. I find the movement. How much movement is too much movement? Now let's let's go back and look at what the manufacturers want in end play. End play. They want a certain amount. Correct. The correct way to measure end play in a wheel end is to have the wheels off and the drum off and the end of the spindle opened up and a magnetic base mounted to the spindle and the dial indicator contact against the hub. And then you're supposed to pull the hub straight out and push it straight in so that you're coming up onto the outer bearing and across onto the inner bearing. And that total lateral movement should be between one and five thousandths one of an five inch thousandths. in play. Very, very, very like about the size of a human hair. Now, just as a, as a, as a, an addendum on this, how long has that procedure been the one that they have wanted you to use? Ever since. Ever since. It's always That's been, always been the, the way they want The engineer's final test on a bearing is in play measured with a dial indicator. Yeah, with an empty hub. Well, you, with 500 pounds of weight, there's no way you can find 5,000. Exactly, pounds. exactly. So with an empty hub, you gotta, you got to do this. you get the dial indicator yeah. in there. And as long as you can get less than 5,000, it's in play. Now, if you go back a number of years, back in the 80s. Quite a number of years. The spec was 15,000. 15,000, yes. And that was fine. And then it became ten thousands, and now for the last ten years or so, it has been five thousands. Five thousands, right? That's the maximum end play you're supposed to have. Okay. You can't feel five thousands end play when you're wiggling a tire. When you're at the tire, you mm -hmm. can't feel it. You can't feel it at all. Okay. It's too small a movement for you to be able to measure. Okay. And feel. Okay. If you're hearing a clicking and a clunking in there. It's more than more 5,000. 5, you must be more than 5,000. Correct. Now, having said that, we understand what the engineers want, and we understand a field method of checking it. It's a great field method. And you can use a dial indicator if you want. The question becomes, what is the proper way to adjust bearings? And what is, in my view, or back to my view, an acceptable method of adjusting bearings? Understanding that no method is perfect. True. Okay? All right. I'm going to describe to you now the method that is recommended by the axle manufacturers and by the Maintenance Council of American Trucking Association and by everybody yep. who doesn't have to make a living adjusting bearings. Or doesn't really, their, ma their major concern is not getting better tire wear. No, no. Their major concern is that the bearing doesn't fail. Exactly. And they get blamed for it. 
Right. They don't want to get blamed. Okay. For and I don't blame them for not wanting to get blamed. That's fine. <coughs> You've got the bear hub. The bear hub is slipped on. The outer bearing is installed. The adjustment nut is put on. You spin the hub and you torque it to 200 foot pounds to seat the wheel seal and the bearing components. Wheel seal, right. You back it off one turn. You spin the hub, you torque it into 50 foot pounds. The book says to back it off, depending on the type of hub and axle and stuff, a third of a turn, a quarter of a turn, or a half of a turn. Then you put the washer and the lock nut on. Or the cotter key, depending on what we've got. Then you're supposed to put the dial indicator on it, and you're supposed to wiggle it back and forth and make sure you're one to five thousandths end plate. Right. That is the factory procedure. And you can dig out any number of wall charts or manuals, and it will take you through that basic procedure. That's pretty much it. That's and right. I, I have no problem with that procedure, except for one small, insignificant problem. For them, it's insignificant. If you follow that procedure, and you back off a third, or a quarter, or a half a turn, and you put the cotter key in it, or the clip ring in it, or you lock it up, you have a 95% chance that when you put the dial indicator on it, it will be more than 5,000 end plate. And the reason it will be more has to do with thread pitch. Thread pitch. Huh. Now on the end of that spindle where the nut screws on, uh -huh. there are threads, and there's two styles. There's a fine thread, fine. which is 18 threads per inch, or a coarse thread, which is 12 threads per inch. Well, not that much different. What a 12 thread pitch means is that if you turned the nut 12 times, it would move one inch. So if you turn the nut one time... You'd move it 83 thousandths. 83 thousandths would be about an eighth of an inch? Um, I don't know. About. I don't much care. <laughs> Point is, it's a lot more than five. It's a lot more than five thousand. Yeah. So one would be bad. How about one half? Well, let's say you tighten it up to zero. Zero. Okay. And you backed it off one quarter of a turn. Of eighty-three thousandths. That'd be twenty-one thousandths. Twenty-one thousandths. How did you just get twenty-one thousandths with one quarter turn and end up with zero to five thousand cent? You cannot end up, and zero is not a good number either, according to the engineers. They want one, one to five thousand. To five thousandths. There's no way you can wind up with that if you moved it to 21 thousandths. Well, that's an issue. Correct. If you had the fine thread, one inch is 18 revolutions. Mm -hmm. One quarter, uh, one full turn is 56 thousandths. Six thousandths, okay, so much less than one. A one quarter one. of a turn is 14 thousandths. Still a little high. Three times what you're supposed to have. You might be able to turn it one flat and get almost 5,000 cent play. You and might. let's say, at that point, let's say you're on this bare empty hub, mm -hmm. and you've got your dial indicator on it, and you've got 5,000 cent play. Terrific. Did it. Got it. Put the drum on, put the wheel on, yes. bolt it down. Yes. Everything's going to be fine now, right? Should be fine. But if I grab it, chances are I'm only going to have zero to 5,000 cent play now. That's the goal. That's the goal. Does that happen? Most times not. Why not? One of the other problems that we're finding is that the type of wheel seals that are used today. Wheel seals? The seal in seal like CR or Federal Mogul. Sure. Is so stiff. It's stiff. Okay. That yeah, when, you, good. when you've got the weight off and you've only got the leverage you've got on the hub, it feels like you're tight now. Yeah. But when you get the leverage of the wheel on there, you A have wheel more and than tire. Than yeah, but see, the, now what we're missing here is they didn't care if there was more than zero to five thousandths end play once there was a wheel and a tire on, just when there was an empty That hand. wasn't part of their concern. I that wasn't that. part of their concern. They didn't care about the tire. Line. Now, understanding all of that, you can continue to use factory spec, use a dial indicator, make sure you're one to five. You will follow factory spec. If a problem occurs with your wheel end assembly, you can go back to the factory and complain and see what they'll do for you. They're not going to do it, you know, the, because they don't sell tires. They sell True. Tires. They sell axles. They sell bearings. But my problem was that the customers who came to me that wanted me to fix their tire work problem had to get the bearing adjusted. 
So what we did years and years ago, around 1990, is I found an article published in Fleet Owner Magazine, written by a guy named Stu Siegel, who's passed on since then. And he was quoting a manufacturer who shall remain nameless. Why should we remain nameless? It's, it's in the article, Federal Mogul. And the other was two fleets. One was Consolidated Freightways, the other was Victory Express. And they were using torque specs to set bearings. Torque specs? Yes. Hmm. Without backing it off. No backing off. You just torque it up and you don't back it off. And you walk away from it. Walk away. The concept was that when you're pushing the bearings together with the nut, you're physically lifting and centering a certain amount of weight on the bearing. And it takes so much torque foot pounds to lift so much pounds of weight. Right. Then when you put the second nut on, it jams the inner nut across the thread and picks up a little more torque if you have a double nut. If you have a single nut with a cotter key or clip ring, you don't get that extra. Right. As a result of this, they found a certain set of torque specs that worked for them. Worked for them. I've played with it over the years, and I found that if a steer tire is a 11R225 or an 11R245 or one of their low pros, the weight of the tire, the rim, and the drum, and the hub caused me to use a certain torque setting. If I had dual wheels, I have another torque setting. If I have a wide base super single, I have a different torque setting. And if I had an empty hub with no, tr no drum, no tires, no rims, I had a different torque set. Yeah. Now, I've been using those numbers for about 20 years now, mm -hmm. and they work just fine. So, we have a set of specs that we use, and we will show them at the end of this. And you're perfectly welcome to use them any way you want. Or you can continue to use it exactly the way the factory tells you to, using a dial indicator and a bear hub and making sure you're one to five. There's a, there is yet another possibility. What's that? You don't have to use our settings no, and no, no, you no. don't have to use that factory setting. Correct. You can, on just about every axle available right now, install a retrofitted sleeve assembly. Yes, there are since about 2000. 99, a product available from Conmet called a preset, mm -hmm. and available from Dana called an LMS, yep. and they are available in kits that you can buy from Timken and SKF and other bearing manufacturers, where you put the bearings in the hub and you put a sleeve on the spindle between a the bearings. A sleeve? You put a sleeve a on the sleeve, spindle? A sleeve, yes. A sleeve. And when you tighten the adjustment nut down to 250 or 300 foot pounds. 250 pounds? And you leave it locked together. Just leave it there? And it's all set. Because the sleeve did what? Sets the bearing space. Set the space between the two bearings so that they roll on the race exactly where they're supposed to be. And no, instead of instead of adjusting or massaging or doing whatever else, just getting bing, monkeys and and you're done. Cut, killing chickens, whatever you had to do. No burning incense. We're done. It's a mechanical truth that these two bearings are going to be pushed up against this sleeve, and that's going to be the right distance because that's well, that's all engineered that way. With yeah. the hub. I like them. Uh, they've been out since '99. Uh, some a lot of you guys don't even know you have them, and you didn't even know there was such a thing as varying problems because these things have been out there for 10 years solving your problems. When one of the truck manufacturers um, tested it on their steer axle on one of their brands of trucks, they have two brands, and the one brand ran it for two years, and the other brand did not run it. And at the end of two years, they compared their failure warranty complaints between the two, and it was so different that starting in 2002, they became standard on steers and drives on all their highway trucks. And I'm just impressed as heck with them. I like them. It's been, it's, been a, it's been a real game changer. But if you don't have them, and if installing them is not an option, then you have to know how to properly adjust bearings. Or you're going to have this tire wear issue with time. Or you will have vibrations. Or vibrations. You will have Right. Irregular brake shoe wear. Yes. Intermittent ABS brake light problems. Seal issues. Uh, seal issues. All of these things. If the bearings aren't tight enough, you will have those problems. All of these can propagate from a loose bearing. One so, last question. What? Lube. 
Luke, Greece. Versus oil. Does, oil. It, does it make any difference to bearing adjustment? Really? Why not? Because if you have a heavy grease in there that is a paraffin wax impregnated with a lubricant, yeah. the paraffin wax slings itself out and adheres to the surfaces. Uh -huh. The oil migrates out of it and still lubricates the bearing the same way. So there's no heavy grease between the bearing. There the isn't race. heavy grease between. It's been pushed out. How could it stay there unless you packed it so tight that it didn't have anywhere to go? And it always goes someplace. Yeah. So the paraffin wax heats up, moves away, the oil comes in and still lubricates it. So the one to five thousandths bearing adjustment is no different regardless of the type of lube you use. Okay. What about uh, the type of bearing? Uh, I'm sorry, spindle. A spindle doesn't bother me. Spindle doesn't change. A no. Barrel type spindle on a trailer doesn't matter. A spindle, uh, taper type spindle. Well, the difference between a taper type and a parallel bearing. Mm -hmm. If the, if you've got a parallel bearing, everything is set this way, so your movement is going to be very free this way. It's not moving up and down the valleys, yeah. but you still don't want any more lateral movement than five thousand. Yes. Now the interesting thing that I've found with the uh, barrel type. Mm -hmm. uh, spindle parallel is bearing. That it's difficult to find whether it's loose. Well, it, with a parallel bearing, you really can't lever it with a bar. You have to push in and out. Yeah, there has to be, yeah. And because there is no taper. And now you got a 500 pound uh, wheel and you're trying to move in and out. So you don't, you can't typically find it on your trailer just by looking at it. It is more difficult, yes. You have, it's best, if you see the wear on the inside edge, best to just go ahead and make sure those bearings are adjusted. There are a lot of people who have gotten to that point where they're, they're just tired of messing around with it. And they've played with our torque settings that they like, and or they've used the dial indicator they like it, and they just to heck with it. I've got a tire work. I'm going to pull it apart. I'm going to either apply the torque or put the dial indicator. I'm going to make sure it's right. Just make sure, you, if, because that's what you do about the wear. That's the solution for the wear is to get to the bearing. The last thing that you need to remember is that if you tighten up the bearing, you had better reset the sensors on your ABS brakes. True. Because the loose bearing is going to cause the sensors to be displaced. Now, here's what everybody's always concerned about. Here's what everybody is sitting there thinking in the back of their mind. What happens if it's too tight? If it's too tight, the wheel won't turn. The wheel won't turn. So this is all, if the wheel spins free, you're fine. Everything's fine. If it's it? not wiggling and I can still spin it, mm -hmm. I'm fine. Now, one other thing on the spin, let's talk about that. I jack up the front wheel and I spin the tire from experience. A properly adjusted bearing when you spin it you give it a good shot it's going to turn a turn and a half and it's going to quit hmm. now okay. if the bearing is properly adjusted and the bearings are engaged to the race and there's a lubricant on it it's going to want to slow down right. typically if you jack it up and you give it a good shot and it just sits there and spins and spins and spins hmm. usually what that indicates is that the bearings are too far apart the hub is dropped down it's only rolling on about the top three or four rollers, and all of the rest of the race is not engaged. And it'll just sit there and spin. Interesting. And when I grab the wheel and shake it, yeah, it's loose. Click, 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 click. Sure is loose. Okay? okay. So a slight drag because of the roller engagement and the lubricant is common. Okay. Okay? That works for me. You have yourselves a great day. All right.